Hello, community. This is Shonda Smith-Baker bringing you Centering Conversations, an exclusive podcast brought to you by Conversations with Shonda. This conversation is powered by Voice Vision Value, Black Women Leading in Philanthropy, and there is an episode that drops every third Wednesday of the month. This episode features Gladys Washington, the retired deputy director of the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation. Gladys is inspirational. She is a godmother to many in philanthropy and a source of many great tips on how to survive and navigate in today's complex environment. We would love it if you would like it. Follow us and rate the podcast. Toya and I came together to do these conversations just to continue to amplify the experiences of Black women in leadership and Black women in philanthropy, and then more broadly, the role of philanthropy in supporting our communities advancing. Oh, you said a mouthful with that one, girlfriend. <laughs> I did. I did. I, You know, I've talked to a lot of Black women across the country who are experiencing a convergence of really heavy work, with a lot of angst around the lack of support, increased expectations without increased resources. You've been in philanthropy and around philanthropy for a long time. Is this, has this always been the case? No, it has not always been the case. Quite frankly, I believe that I was ultimately chosen, but it was not a straight path. Um, most things never are. I was a um, single mother uh, with a young son without possibilities. And at the time I was in Florida, I actually um, worked at all male prisons for a long time because it was a way to elevate myself and my son out of poverty. I soon realized that that was not where I needed to be based on who was locked up, why they were locked up how they continue to be locked up and mistreated. And I was a part of the system and I quit and went back to school and, and finished my undergraduate degree and then a master's. And um, when I was working on my master's, I had the opportunity. I knew I wasn't going to be a researcher. That is not what I do. And a community foundation needed someone to support their work around creating um, community development as a foci of the community foundation. So as a grad student and part of my graduate assistantship, I went to that community foundation in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that was the, the start of the trajectory, if you will. And I was already an old person when I went to school. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's more like a, a second half or something. I don't know. I soon learned that I was uh, supposed to be there. And I also learned the limitations, for example, of a community foundation, which I did not like things like DAPS and other kinds of um, <laughs> practices that um, preserve rich people's monies for cats and dogs and not for people. Um, and so I decided to go and work on my PhD um, because I couldn't handle that one anymore. And I said, okay, let me go work on a PhD. So I did that, University of South Carolina. <laughs> Actually, that was a defining moment for me as well. And the reason it was a defining moment for me is as I went into those classes, one in particular, it said that the Danish never held slaves. Um, and I said, excuse me, <laughs> let me let me school you a little bit here. My family is from St. Croix and U.S. Virgin Islands. We were under the Danish flag uh, for many, many, many years before America. And so just the, the non-attention to uh, race and telling the truth is, was not a part of the process. And um, I have one funny story. I mean, that's not funny, but it caused me to quit. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I had a um, recurring nightmare, quite fr frankly. And I had long locks and, you know, all of that. And I would stand in front of um, 
the building uh, at USC. And it was a cup, like I was standing out there like a homeless person with a cup. And it said, please join my committee. And the white professors would just walk by. Like you do, like people do with homeless people on the street. That was a recurring nightmare for me. And that's when I figured out, ah, maybe you're in the wrong spot. Um, and so in my first semester of coursework, um, I did learn a lot in that first semester of, of, of coursework because I worked for the chair of the Democratic National Committee at that time. Oh, wow. uh, he was a professor there and I was his TA. Um, so I learned a lot about what I would eventually do in terms of democratic politics and power building and race and how it shows up in that system. But anyway, after my first semester, I decided to quit. But in the middle of that semester, mm -hmm. um, the Babcock Foundation uh, was looking for someone um, and their investments had been very good uh, and they decided to add a position. And I went there as a senior program person at the Babcock Foundation. They hired me. And so I started Babcock Foundation in 1999 and retired from, from there. Did you like working in that type of foundation more so than the community foundation? Was that a better fit? Yeah, it was a better fit because one, it was a family foundation. Two, it was a, a about that foundation. You know, they were, I'll say liberal, not quite progressive at that time, but I'll say liberal enough to want to make a difference across the South. That's hard work because it's based in North Carolina and they worked in, uh, we worked in 11 states across the Southeast. And so it was, um, it, it was interesting. Um, I met race every day, um, and it, both inside and out. Uh, but of course I carry it with me everywhere I go. So here we are. It was in that platform that I learned, um, one about philanthropy, two about what my role was, and it was beyond philanthropy. Mm -hmm. um, it was being in community. Yeah. It was learning from people on the ground, understanding that my education was just education. It meant that I listened more and talked less. It meant that I could learn from those folks for me to be a better grant maker. And so, you know, I, I, I cherished it, that time at, at Babcock Foundation. They did for a long time and still do in big ways now. Um, they, they spent more than 5%. Oh, had that ethic. Um, the family was willing to learn. We, they put folk from Black folk, Brown folk, um, gay folk, all kind of folk on the board to help guide their decision making because none of them, they were rich folk. So they didn't know anything about poverty and struggle and race in the same way. Now they had to learn, but they were willing to actually, I, and I give them you know, a lot of credit for that because they put their money where, where their mouths were. That was a, well, it wasn't a, 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 you know, an idyllic, situation all the time because we had internal lots of in, internal conversations about power and race interestingly enough because of the power dynamic when I rolled out my power was perceived as less than the white folk how did that so, show up how, well it showed up okay I'll give you a, a classic example it was Okay, these folks wanted somebody from the Badpack Foundation to be in a deep south state. Oh, I can name it. What the heck? Anyway, mm -hmm. Alabama. And okay, so, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and so what they did was they called uh, uh, to the foundation, we're having this, that, or the other thing, and we'd like a representative there from the Badpack Foundation. And um, basically, um, the CEO, uh, she was an executive director back then, but she, she said simply, it's her or it's no one. 
So we don't have to come. Uh, yeah. We internally, we, we walk some lines to better understand each other so we can make the grant making better in community. And so mm-hmm. in walking those lines, um, we dealt with the pa- power dynamics between, about the money and who had the power to give it up. And so there were multiple instances like that where finally some folk figured out that, well, maybe the colored girl is the one y'all need to talk to. Yeah, again, not idyllic. We had hard conversations and learned some hard lessons too. Did you feel largely listened to in those conversations or did you have to be convincing? Well, I think it's both. And and let me tell you what I mean. I'm not shy about a lot of things. (laughs) So (laughs) I just tell the truth and shame the devil. Mm -hmm. process. Now, sometimes that doesn't come come out graceful or wonderful. And and most times I want it not to come out graceful and nice because this is serious business. This is serious work. And so in order for us to do it, we have to be different. Yeah. And so white folk, People in the South used to call us those crazy women from North Carolina. It was three of us. It was the executive director, deputy director, and me, senior program person. So they called us the the three crazy women. We out there talking about the impact of poverty and racism on communities and people. We out there talking about um, policy and systems change. And so um, we would just kind of call the crazy women from North Carolina. But I had two compadres that we worked through so many issues uh, around race, class, and power, even talking about the class of, of, of folks that whose money we were putting on the street. In philanthropy, just to um, loop back to the question, because it, it feels like particularly the, the foundations that have a commitment of addressing disparity my assumption coming in would be that there would be more of a muscle and an ability to actually talk about race and power. Right. And you were doing this work in 99. Mm -hmm. And I'm in Minnesota. It felt like following George Floyd's murder, the conversation was more present, but the emotions were higher. Mm-hmm. So while we were talking about it more, I'm not sure that we actually were getting anywhere. We came further, perhaps, but there were times where it just felt like it was too integrated with emotion for it to be effective or for it to be applied into institutions, right? Both on boards I've sat on or organizations I worked around or in or whatever it is. What needs to happen in philanthropy for us to be more honest about race and power and privilege? Um, well, uh, right now I'm 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 struggling with um what I notice about philanthropy. And so what what I mean by that is, you know, when, let me go back just a bit to your question, some to your lead into the question. We as um and you know I can't I can't speak for black people and I'm not trying to, but I've lived a long time. What I've seen is that we've walked around in shells and cocoons, and we could never show emotions. We could never say, you know what, that, that that's that that's some bad stuff right there. It's just not right. And y'all know it's not right. We 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 couldn't do that. So as a part of the evolution around the George Floyd uh murder is this um this rage that we have from being marginalized from living in communities that don't suit us from having poor jobs and poor prospects. And sometimes we don't know what to do with that. Nobody does. I don't care what race we are. So that had to be, it it felt like a necessary part of the equation. Did folk get hurt? Did folk get locked up? Get 
all of that happened. But I'm acknowledging that anger and rage was a is a part of the process yeah. that can lead to change. Mm-hmm. And in large measure, that has that, you know, you heard all kinds of, of course, foundations come out and talk about how much money they're gonna put in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they haven't done that. Mm-hmm. To be perfectly frank. And those that have are now pulling back on things like. Um, like uh, voter education and organizing and civic engagement and participation and all of those things, they're pulling back their money now. When we are facing a 2024 election, this, yeah. is, the, this is the time you dig in. It is time to dig in. It also feels like they're pulling back from their investments or engagement around criminal justice reform, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which was actually the catalyst for all of this disruption right right Increased public safety probably tempered it a bit yeah they're related yeah it's all it's it's like this it's it's circular those folks gonna act right because of this and this has happened and they go to this and they do this and they it's they 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 all the time but you know folks don't really want to learn i'll say Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, we 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 already know that we're going to move on past that. And yeah, well, but life is a is a continuous process of learning, is it not? Philanthropy should be too. Yeah, one of the questions that I've been asking for your time in in philanthropy, who did you have to be to show up in the work? That's an excellent question. Uh, I want to say that the the answer, because it makes me feel better, is that I showed up as me. Hmm. Frank, honest. Oftentimes, I didn't care what you thought uh, about me. It, it, and, you know, and I learned sometimes um, you need to pull back from that. But, I, you know, I was old when I went there, so it wasn't much change in happening. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I did find myself not putting on a suit rather than what I wanted to put on. Mm. I mean, th- and that's basic stuff, but it's real because it says something. It but does. then I remember something my mother taught me, and my mother taught me. My mother decided she was never going to work for a white person again, and she sold life insurance with Atlanta Life Insurance Company. Now, she passed away in 1963, so we're talking 50s and 60s, right? Mm -hmm. So, like I said, she sold um, insurance for a Black life insurance company. But every day she went out uh, to collect those little books that sat on the porch with the 67, 42 cents in it. She was dressed to the nines. So I learned that I went to community that way. So now I might have been your board meeting with that suit jacket on, but in community, I looked even better. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, I wanted to give the community my best. That's one. Number two is oftentimes um, we have to sit in rooms and we are constrained by ourselves. Our internal thing in our heads says, don't say that. You're going to be unemployed. Don't say that <laughs> because it will create this, that, or the other. But I believe out of disruption uh, comes opportunity. So sometimes you have to. And sometimes you need to just be you and do you and show up as you, show up as your culture, show up as your people, just show up that way. Because it creates something inside of you that is not healthy for us. Yeah. We hold in um, stuff and we have a whole lot to say. We yeah. do. We have a whole lot to say. We hold it in. That creates problems for us health wise. Yeah. You know, I'm not a crier at all. Like I just am not. But I did cry one day at work. Okay. And what, how the story went, how I remember the story was I was introducing something that I wanted to be considered. And honestly, it shouldn't even have had been that big of a deal in my mind. 
And I just finished reading um, this book. And it talked about the compromises that people of color often make um, in philanthropy, the negotiations that we go through, the withering of oneself, the weathering of the conditions, like all of these things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that you become so conformist that you are you can almost be uh, a whisper of yourself. That's right. So I had just finished reading it the night before, like 1 a.m., right? Like I'm a night out, 1 a.m. So I have this meeting in the morning and I present my idea. They say no. So I could feel my eyes welling up, right? And I'm not talking like a boohoo cry. I'm talking like I want to punch a wall cry, right? Like it wasn't like I was angry. I was angry. And um, and I know that there are other questions or other opportunities that have been bigger investments that had less questions and took less time. Mm-hmm. It was it was impossible for me to separate what I was asking from my identity, from what I had read and all those compromises. It was almost like a tipping point. And I was pissed. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with being pissed. Now, when you're pissed, there are ways to manage that pissedness. Right. Yeah, I sure did a good job. <laughs> but it, sure I did good. Uh, uh, I sure um, did. They're like, you don't have to be embarrassed. I'm like, I'm not embarrassed. No, no. And we just I am angry. To... I'm not embarrassed. And and mad will make you cry quicker than anything else. It just will. Yeah. I mean, anger yeah. does that, right? So I learned to um sort of pull those kinds of things around, move them around. And be able to talk about honestly, reflectively about what I have seen. Yeah. And when you talk about what you've seen and what has been done, um, sometimes and and see the other part is is that I I'm I was I wasn't into saving white folk. I just was. I in the saving white folk. I'm in the saving black people. That's who I'm. I'm in the saving. Um, and did I support white led organizations? Absolutely. But in the South, I had to, right? Um, but I wasn't interested in saving them. I was interested in changing something that helped the people on the ground that I, that I needed to happen and wanted. They wanted to happen, and I I did that by sort of shifting and changing the conversation some. It's like, yeah. okay, well, that's not what you will do. Let me learn, let me learn a little bit more about what you have done and let's see what we can do. And so sometimes we negotiate. Sometimes we just have to be pissed off. And I think that what you're talking about, and maybe this was you started out talking about you had to negotiate or work work on racism internal and external, is this idea of the level of strategy that we have to think through to exist in space that assists with the level of exhaustion that so many of us have faced. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I first met you at um, the Black Women in Philanthropy Retreat Mm -hmm. in 2017. I had not yet started my job. So Toya invited me, sponsored me to go to the retreat a week before I formally started in my role. And I've shared this story before on the podcast, but I go in, it was the year that there was all that breathing exercising. And I remember thinking, why are these people so stressed out? <laughs> They're just giving away money. Like, what is happening in this second? Like, I mean, I was so wide-eyed. And I'm like, I was just sitting back and I'm just like, what <laughs> is happening? Why do we need so much stress relieving um techniques? <laughs> I found out. I was about to say, when did you learn that you had 
to do those things. I, I bet you, I mean, it was before not before I hit 90 days for sure. I believe it. Mm-hmm. I, I believe it. Because it 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 is stressful. Having been in it for probably 25 years, I'm of a slightly different generation than you. Now that, that doesn't make us different. We still black women. Mm-hmm. But I came from the generation where black women just endure. That's one of the reasons why we founded the retreat, uh, the Black Women in Philanthropy Retreat, because we recognized that there were a couple like me who didn't even know how to say stress, mm-hmm. who didn't even know how to um, articulate saving ourselves, not just our, our people in community um, and helping uh, folks get what they need, we couldn't save ourselves. I don't know that we knew that knew what that meant back then. And I had some wonderful teachers who are a little bit older than me who who endured, but I don't know what they went through to endure. I mean, I think that's part of the centering conversations and the purpose of it is because we don't share what we've had to endure. Mm-hmm. And um, I was recently, my my church recently had a revival and it was that we've been taught to not talk about what's happening in our homes or in ourselves. And by virtue of that, we're not passing on how we survive the, the testimony, if you will, right? That if if Miss Gladys has done it, I can get through it. Like if she was able to do it, she's got strategy, she's got resources, she has perspective that would allow me to have the balance to be sustained. Not true. Not and true. Say more. Not true. Not well. I mean, and, and maybe that's how somebody looks at. Mm-hmm. I'm. I'm just not sure that we knew how hmm. to even articulate those things. Could you do it now in the rear view? Um, sure. I can do but it. In- while, but while you were in it, you just couldn't. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah, I just, just couldn't. Didn't, didn't even know what I, um, some days what I was feeling and definitely didn't know what the name of it was. I just knew that there was something in my soul um, that it was not right. Something in my spirit. And uh, at the same time, I just kind of went back and said, you know what, you you really just pissed me off. And that's that that's my in lots of ways, that's my personality. So nobody was surprised when I said, you know what, you pissed me off yesterday. Um, by the same token, I didn't fight every battle like that. Can we talk Again. about that? Because I'm sitting in the generation between those that maybe didn't fight the battle like generalization, right, of what you're saying, sort Mm -hmm. of like you go along to get along, whoever makes the rules is in charge, language, to my kids' generation, which is fight the powers that be. (laughs) And And I sit right right in the middle, right? Like (laughs) I'm sitting right in the middle generationally. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, you know, I I have to credit some of the folks that I learned uh, from in the South. Um, that were not inside philanthropy. They were in communities like um, Hollis Watkins. He just died uh, a few days ago. And not, you, can, you can probably Google him and he will come up. Yeah. Master organizer. He was with SNCC all of his life. He dedicated to organizing in Mississippi. Right. Oh, wow. Not an easy thing to do. He was 82 or 84. He died the other day. He's one of the people I learned from, and there are countless others about strategy. And I learned that as a part of walking in philanthropy, you've got to understand strategy. Okay, strategically, I want this to happen, right? In here, they just said, no, all right, well, let me figure out the steps that I need to take to get them where I am. Now, that that takes a lot. To, to do that because it is okay you know it's like the meeting after the meeting really yeah but i mean it's it's the same um it's the same concept to the degree that you want 
somebody else's behavior to change. But then I had to ask myself, what did what what did I need to change as a result? That's you know, and so whatever it was, it was strategic. The steps to get to what we need. It was me changing. And sometimes it was just giving it up because yeah. it, the cost for me is too much. And sometimes I had, that was part of the strategy and the, the equation. Yeah. And you've named a couple, right? Like you can't you can't fight every battle. Nope. You have to know when it's not the right time. If you're not the right person, you have to know when it just isn't right. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a level of um, addressing the issue. And then there's time to just sit back and watch it unfold. Watch it unfold. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, we 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 end up picking up the pieces for white people. You said you do. (laughs) (laughs) Picking up the pieces. Y'all want the mess cleaned up. huh? Okay. Mm hmm. Don't like it. <laughs> you, you, okay. I, I, I use bad words, so I'm gonna be cool. <laughs> but I, just got, look, I, I just got the podcast out of explicit rating. <laughs> oh, <you're> good. <laughs> all the f bombs people were dropping, and I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I know I've been chomping at the bit, girlfriend. Because I amazing. bet you have. I bet it's you have. Part of my vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I got to work at it too. What my experience of you when when I met you, right? And I'm I'm an observer in many respects, but is that you're sort of the the auntie, the godmother of a community of women that have such reverence for you that um, my experience has been that folks that have achieved in a space sometimes can be inaccessible. And if they're accessible, it is guarded, right? There is a protection around who they might be. Um, And so they're in conversation with you, but you don't really get to know them. Mm -hmm. So you walk into the space and you're like 100% what I see, what I've seen, observe, is that you are unfiltered with the women that have been around you, which then in turn allows them to be unfiltered with you. Can we talk about the benefit of that to you and to the women? Because a lot of us are holding on tight and there's a liberation with just letting all of that go. Well, I, one was a selfish benefit. So let me explain that. It was about... um me giving something. And I didn't want men and me's, but I wanted black women to think about themselves. I wanted them to feel good about themselves. I wanted to do, for them to do something magnificent and wonderful for our people. So I, it, it just felt right to give it to them, unfiltered, mm-hmm. right? So that was, um, that was part of what, what it was for me. I hope, uh, and I still hope, that something I said or did stays with them over time. And it didn't start out th- that this way, but it, it's become, um, it, with great intentionality, how I show up. Because I believe that I have learned some things that can help somebody in philanthropy, particularly Black women. And I've done it for Black young men, too. Because, you know, we, it is our duty and responsibility not to carry what we know and have learned to the grave with us. Part of our legacy is leaving it with somebody else, whether it's named or unnamed. Yeah. Never got to call my name. But what'd you learn? Did I give you one tiny little tarnished pearl that said, that there's a way to do this work and it starts here. Yeah. And it starts. Here. Yeah. So start your head and, and your heart. Your heart. And so that's what I got out of it. And like I said, I hope that somebody stood a little taller, remembered something, and began to laugh because you know I curse a lot. So some everybody curse, um, everybody laughed. 
and to break down barriers between us as women. That was first and foremost. Um, Let's because, talk about that. What's the barriers between women? What's that about? Well, the barriers between women are these. One is how we look. That's the most common, right? It's it's how we show up. It's how we dress. I mean, superficial, absolutely superficial stuff. But we still do it. Hmm. Yes, we, we still do. Um, and then we judge and misjudge all the time based upon how somebody shows up in the work. Let's say it's a, a black CEO in organization that we know about, for example, and they do something um, in their work that might sound crazy to me or you, right? Well, that creates a barrier. I'm not talking to that sister. But she can't learn none from me and I can't learn none from her. I'm not talking to that sister because, you know, them folk got her already. But we don't know what people have to endure when they sit in those rooms with other folk who control the money. So we just need to stop the judgment stuff because that's what we do. We judge each other. Mm -hmm. And so when we started, when, when Black Women Philanthropy, we wanted a space where it was judgment free. Now, did it happen all the time? No, I'm certain it didn't, right? Um, but that was part of the goal. We we needed our own space to do what we wanted to, wanted to do. And oftentimes, just like how you got there, like you said, Toya gave you, uh, sponsored you to be there. Um, a number of women, their foundations did not support them being there. So they paid their own way. Yeah. They found it valuable enough to pay their own, own way. But back to my original point is that we just have to give each other more and love each other more. Um, because I believe that's a, that's one of our roles. If, if philanthropy, what's the meaning of the word? Yeah. yeah. So we ought to give it to ourselves and each other. First. That's right. Yeah. You said you didn't start out that way. No, I didn't. How, like what, what evolved you? Was it, was it wisdom? Was it, what did you notice? And then what were you intentional about changing in yourself? All right, girlfriend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. Cause I feel like I had, I feel like I've, I've just had some, my own evolutions on this. So I want to hear what yours were. Well, first of all, I was pretty, um, at, coming from where I came from, I was pretty jaded, right? Um, jaded and and hopeful and all, all that at the same time because I, I came from the penitentiary. I tell people that all the time. And it was doggy dog. And I, 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 I viewed the world through that lens for a long time. I'm not Doggy sure. I didn't dog, winners and losers. That's sort yeah. Of okay. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure that I've admitted that to anybody. Oh, and I'm not even drinking Hennessy today. Um, <laughs> this is tea. I was thinking about it when I was drinking this. I'm like, this is tea. It's not tea. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked in with an expectation, having come from a community foundation and getting really disappointed about what that was about. I was still walking with that. And at the same time, I decided, okay, all right, girlfriend, you got to do something different here, right? Um, had a conversation with myself and just decided that, you know, you can't walk with, with that anger like that. So how do you channel it? What difference do you make? How do you use these folk money and be real secure in who it is and what it is you're doing, go out there and learn. Mm -hmm. Ask folk in community. Ask them how, how you should show up. Um, and community folk, you know, when 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 you you approach them right, they give it to you right. There's the straight, naked, shown up truth. Yeah. And they gave me that truth. 
And that truth was about me too. That truth was about, okay, you know now you don't need to come down here. Somebody have no meat with us and don't feed us. What's wrong with you? You right. I'm going to feed y'all every time with that them people money. Yes, I am. It was, um, you know, you can't sit here and try to figure out my life. Tell me about yours. So it was, I, I got taught um, uh, this give and take thing that helped me to be, like I said, a better grant maker. I went back in the house fortified. Mm -hmm. from what had happened in community because they gave so much to me. Yeah. And so that changed, um, that changed me. That changed my trajectory. That changed how I have mentored folk in this work. And, and so I, 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 I'm just grateful every day for those folks. I have said and feel, and I've said this to, to Toya Randall is that, her sponsorship before I started was a moment of change for me mm -hmm. because I was so appreciative and I could sometimes look at the work and sometimes, and often we look at the work like it's external, but the way in which she moves and supports people and, and women in particular, black women, and how she has supported me has made me want to support women more than I have. Right. It wasn't that I wasn't conscious of it, but I wasn't as intentional about it. In this work, it is hard and there's all these compromises, but it sure feels easier when you're talking to other people that are facing the same decision points that are, are trying to master the same circumstances from their parts of the world, the, the state, the country, and to be able to do that and, and trust and love and sisterhood, it has really opened up a lot for me in terms of how I show up. That is wonderful. Yeah. That is wonderful. Yeah. I think the other inflection point was when my mom died. Mm, I'm sorry. Yeah. In 2020. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was it was tough, but it also made me think, you know, you think about your own life and, and it was, did she imagine, did she live all that she imagined for herself? That is wonderful. That and is wonderful. God bless you. You had a good mama. I had a great mama. All right. All right. Yeah. Those life issues, we all have to go through them, right? We just do. If you live, you're, you're going to leave here. And so, you know, I, I, I kind of learned that we, uh, as women, again, carry so much. And I'll, I'll tell you a brief story. Um, I was married for 30, 35 years. My husband was um, much older than I. We had a kid and I had a kid already. And anyway, the point is, that he had dementia for eight years. And I took care of him in our home, managed his care, handled um, all of that. I got on planes for Backpack Foundation every almost every week um, and still took care of him. And when he passed away, he passed away in our home with our children and grandchildren around us. That experience almost broke me into almost broke me into mm. um and my um my doctor had a wonderful african doctor in wilson salem and he just said to me he said you know miss washington and this was another turning point for me you took really good care of mr washington but you didn't take care of yourself Ooh. So it was basically um, on that day that I was just, I decided I was coming and going to live on this island. The same yeah. yeah. In your ancestral home. Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So we, we have, have, we still have these life, I'm no person, but we still have these life experiences that change us. 
and they should. We shouldn't be static and um, we have to learn some things um, and we have to go through some things. Yeah. Some of our stuff as women is self-imposed. See, that was self-imposed to me. I could have put my husband at home. I just chose not to do it. Self-imposed. Right. I could have let somebody else. Family in. values probably mixed in there. I mean, my yeah, mom, my mom passed yes. from Alzheimer's. I had her here with me for six weeks yeah. in the room that I'm in right now. Yeah. I know that experience. I know mm-hmm. that experience. No, it just, it, 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 it wears on you, beats you down. It just, we have this name that it, it, it does what it does. Right. Yeah. Uh, Cause it, it's, it ain't nothing nice. Like they say in New Orleans, it ain't nothing nice. It's nothing nice. What, why do you think that we, what is with the self-imposed behavior? Is it that we are used to holding all the weight? Are we afraid of asking for help? Are we, we've been the center of all things. And so we stay the center of all things. Like what, what do we need to examine? Because I'm watching women and black women, the toll that it's taking on our our bodies and our spirit. We need to think differently about how we're managing it all because we're not really managing it all with no consequence. That's right. That's right. Two th- only two things I'll say, and one of them is that we need to get over this notion that we are the strongest beings on earth. Mm. We aren't, right? We were not designed to be. We've yeah. been taught some things that folk, all of our folk and all the rest of them folk assume that we are the strongest human beings on earth. We aren't. It's naming that. The other is, and you said it earlier, we don't like to ask for help. We just don't. And we will be in tears. We will be broke. We will be struggling. We will be all those things. And as you said, too, people taught us what stays in this house, what goes happens in this house, stays in this house. Mm-hmm. And so that foolishness has endured generations. Right. Uh, I don't blame my ancestors at all. For creating those kinds of dynamics. But I believe it's our role to break them. Just break them. Name it. To, let's name it for each other. Let, let's cry together. Let's go head on. Um, and even go to a therapist or somebody. Yeah. The other one is, and to Sean Macon and I discussed this when I talked with her, is that you got to work twice as hard to go half as far. That's right. And and she was like, you know, that that's foolish. You work your you work yourself to death to, to never catch up. Never catch up. Right? Now yeah. our ancestors meant it to inspire drive. Mm-hmm. Right? To mm-hmm. to to have us be great workers, to have drive, all of those things. It was meant for good intention. That's what Cheshan shared. But ultimately you're working twice as hard to never catch up. To never catch up. And what I am suggesting is that we move the finish line back. Mm, Say more. Well, what I'm saying is we are trying to get to this, this, this imaginary line that says that we've made it in some way, that we've done it in some way, that we are, I'm saying, move it back to your satisfaction. Then so you don't feel like, so, you know, so we don't feel like we are working twice as hard to get, get um half the weight right that um move it back move the marker yeah. and whose standards the more basic question is whose standards are we using to determine whether i made it to that line or not yeah yeah because my the my approach would tell me that i have to go half as fast to be in the right relationships to have a deeper outcome and a sustained impact. That's what it tells me that to be in relationship with community in the way you need to, to move from the transactional and the individualistic approaches to relational and communal means that it actually takes more time. Mm -hmm. And it does take more time, but that's transformational. It could be transformational. 
mm-hmm. and it, it and is quite possibly steps along the way. But in any event, we got to let ourselves off the hook so because we are holding somebody else's expectations. And so when we hold other people's expectations, they keep moving the line. Yeah. We don't move it. They keep moving it for us. And we internalize it so much that we don't even know what the line is anymore. So we're chasing an imaginary goal. Exactly. And the way you describe being in relationship with people, learning who they are, talking and understanding, that's worth slowing down for. It's richer. And again, can be more fruitful ultimately. Yeah. Because it it means that we're caring for people along the way, not just ourselves. And I think that is just as important as having that big name played on your door. Agreed. You know, I had a a interesting conversation with a friend um, yesterday around uh, impact reporting. And we were talking about there is some work that you do that you can measure more quickly. Mm -hmm. I started out in in youth work. He works in uh, a Pika Head Start. And we have, you know, some of the kids that I worked with are now in their 20s. Mm -hmm. They'll come up to me and they'll say, you know, Ms. Shonda, when you did this for me, I still remember it. It actually changed the way that I do X. And you get these conversations, right? Like that's the best data that I could ever have, right? So a lot of times when you're working in these systems and they want immediate feedback, there, yes, of course, there's short-term things that you can measure. But when you're working with people, it's no different than the experience that you gain. So, you know, later on, you reflect on it and you're like, oh, I get it now. That just clicked in what I learned 10 years ago. It, it now I have the I have the right life context to apply it. I didn't have it then, but I have it now. To the point of working twice as hard or slowing down the transformation of the transactional. Did you ever figure out impact reporting while you were in philanthropy? No. But then I, I didn't try. What I did instead was help people to articulate. You know, again, we're working with small time windows in philanthropy, right? Which is a problem, right? Mm-hmm. That's a problem. Um, stuff, for lack of a better word, has mm-hmm. been jacked up for a very long time. And you want it all fixed over a two-year grant cycle. What would be wrong with you? Okay. Um, So that's number one. That's the the challenge of of sort of, you know, impact reporting. Now, the foundation I worked for had a little bit longer horizon. It was 10 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, 10 years set of um, priorities. And what we did was, um, all right. That's where you're trying to go. You're trying to go up there. What are, what are the what are the steps that get you there? So, if it's organizing, for example, we're organizing in, in the community. It's 250 residents. That's one of the things that we want to do. We've chosen our. We have chosen, and it sounds like activities, but it's not. It's outcomes. It's actual outcomes. So um, you're measuring the strategies that will allow you to achieve the goal in ten years. Right there. A goal so a lot of times what happens is that they skip the strategies right. and want the outcome. Want the outcome, right. Okay. And I, I don't understand how, and which is often what I've had to explain, is how you figure we get there. Just because you want it, 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 you got that kind of power. Oh, okay. All right. So, <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is asking for a different set of metrics that's longitudinal. Mm. Right. So I, you know, I we'll never get to that one. Not in organized philanthropy. That's why we need our own. So, that part. That part. That part. In 2020, uh, two of my uh, people in this world, and uh, we started um, this collective to combat anti-blackness and philanthropy. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So it started after the inflection point, and then we began to meet and meet and meet and gather information in community from community, from others in the space, and it evolved into the Black Collective Foundation, a Black foundation that we're we launched here, and we're we're looking to get resources for to to make sure that it's sustained um, generationally. But one of the things that really spoke to me is that I've been working in institutions where we're helping unlearn behaviors to move forward in relationships with more diverse communities, with the type of outcomes that are expected. But that to build something from the ground with the DNA of community and culture, Mm -hmm. right? And so that becomes the intentional action of how do you preserve it? And, and its principles and its practices within a sector that will push you out of that. Mm-hmm. And, and how do you how do you have the right balance within that? And, you know, it's not to say that I can't work in other spaces because I have an appreciation for that work as well. But there is something about being in a place that you're building. And, you know, our, our tagline, if you will, is in investing in the genius of backlight change. Mm-hmm. And even I when it. I say it, it just makes my heart happy. I like it. <laughs> I like <laughs> it, it makes my heart happy. <laughs> For Black women in philanthropy that um, are holding a lot right now, what, what advice would you give them? I have a couple things. And one is that, you know, we take ourselves too seriously. And so it's two words, lighten up. <laughs> okay. I feel that. Mm-hmm. Lighten up. Lighten up. Um, you know, some of us think that getting a manicure and a pedicure is rest and relaxation. It is not. It's just getting a manicure and a pedicure. Mm-hmm. Most of us take our phones in there with us. We're working. While they trying to work on us, they you know, so that is not. Find what gives you rest. All of us don't rest the same way. Find what there's, I mean, you know, what provides you rest. The the third thing, um, I think, and and it may sound kind of um uh, sensical, <laughs> um, and that is lay in your bed. And that it is that a terrible thing to just lay in your bed when it's not time to lay in your bed. Mm. Twelve o'clock in the middle of the day. Mm, the nap ministry. Yes. <laughs> well, you ain't even got to go to sleep. Then later. Mm-hmm. You know, of course. Um, and so uh, again, it, it it's we have to begin a practice. Mm of taking care of ourselves differently, or we won't live long enough to tell the story. Right. Again, we we take ourselves too seriously, but we need to stop sometimes and do one thing it reminded me of when we came on this conversation, and that is simply to breathe. Mm. We walk around like this. I've seen sisters with their, the whole of their chest in. It's like being a girl. Yeah. And they, I used to say you can work hard and still have joy. Yes, you can. Yes, right. You can. Like I don't I think that we think that hard work and working in serious issues means that it has to be heavy. I'm like, actually, it demands that it actually has more joy and emphasis on laughter. Right. Community so that you can balance the weight. Right. You can't just be heavy all the time. Yeah. And I I train up uh, um folks who came under me at the foundation, um, that one of the ways you find joy in the work, if you're Black and you work for a um, a white foundation, is to get out of the hallowed halls. Say say what? Say Get what? out of the hallowed halls. Get out there. Talk to the community. Go to the community. Ride around. Get lost. Talk to the brother standing right there uh, on the corner by the grocery store. He be, he might be waiting on his little sister to take mm-hmm. her to school. Talk to, to people. Get energized by what they say, even though um, in some of our communities, it's tough. 
but yeah. you find joy in having the conversation, learning something from somebody that's new, and you get to learn more about your work and what your role has to be, not yeah. what they need it to be, but what it has to be. Yeah, for you. that's good advice. Yeah, being in community will, first of all, they affirm you. That's right. If you walk in humble, now I've heard, I've seen them break some folk down. Oh, well, they've affirmed me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let me personalize it. <laughs> when I get out there, I my cup is full, and I yeah. feel um, I feel impactful. I feel accountable, and I feel like I'm learning. Yep, and I always consider it a blessing. Absolutely a blessing. For the, What advice do you have for those that are supporting Black women in the workplace? Oh, um, one, I think, is first of all, to listen. Everybody's experience is not the same. Y'all can be doing the same job right next to each other in, in, in adjoining offices, et cetera, et cetera. And your experience won't be the same as that person's. Experience. So you mean that if they go and ask another black woman if they agree with a point of view of another black woman, it could possibly be different? Could possibly, yeah. One would think. I know just just like as many human beings as that is, there are that many opinions, right? Oh <laughs> so listen. <laughs> <laughs> listen. <laughs> um and Consider what learning looks like. Do you know I, I lean on listening and learning because I just believe that that that's just the way it happens. Um, be of assistance, mm-hmm. and you know, sort of what I mean by that. It may be that it's just an affirmation that says, "Sister, that's that's right, and you right." And I thank you for what you're doing. It could be simply just an affirmation of their presence and their work. It could be sometimes a strategy session about how we're going to get around this foolishness that we see in this institution in a day. How are we going to do that? Yep. Um, And I I learned that from people on the ground. Strategy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes now I we, we like to say and have our kumbaya moments and all that good stuff. Sometimes we have to let sisters go because it's not a right fit. Because they're too. Oh, well, it's not a right fit. Mm-hmm. I'll leave it there. Understood. It, it's about respect ultimately, because we 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 aren't gonna always agree. Right. Your perspective is not my perspective. Sometimes they are the same, but sometimes they are not. And so it's respectfully to say, okay, cool, no problem. And nobody's mad. And so it is, it is, it is giving with respect and receiving with respect. I think that's fair. I think the challenge often becomes when. Um, there's an inability to share the experience on either side, right? That um, it feels really dominant here. I mean, this is where I spend most of my space where they're solving a problem that neither party has been honest about the experience, Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it's centered in the work, but most of the time it's centered on how they're approaching each other relationally. Those are the calls that I get. I'm trying to explain this. This is how it's showing up. I need help navigating the responses. Right. Um, Or people feeling tokenized in the work, even if they're saying the same goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so. It's interesting. It's an interesting time. But I do know that in these conversations that there has been. Um, many themes that would allow for reflection for those that are in the work, those that are supporting the work, or those that are supporting Black women 
in philanthropy or, or any other space, frankly, mm-hmm. um, or anyone that's not you requires you to understand their their circumstances different, right? Like it just requires anybody who's not you, you should just apply it. Right. Equally. And, you know, it's, it, I don't know. You know, I, I am... I, I've been trying to figure us out for a long time because I've been trying to figure myself out, which is, you know, sort of um, understanding oneself is um, is a critical part of all of this. I think I'm going to die without fully understanding myself. And um, I'm probably OK with that. Probably that yeah, I'm, I'm probably OK. OK with that, um, because, I, you know, I'm I'm. I'm at a stage where um I don't care no more. But <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. But no, uh, uh, I'm trying to be useful here. Um, I don't know, but I know that again, that this this notion of 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 common respect and standing in, in the space of truth helps a lot. Does it mean that folk won't get mad? No, doesn't mean that at all. Because they might just. I've told the truth for some sisters who've had to come back to me and say, you know what, Gladys, you were right. Mm-hmm. Actually, when they come back, they say, Miss Gladys, I was like, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, you can't yeah. write about something, but it's okay. It's okay. Um, again, we have to walk with the spirit of forgiveness for each other. Because we don't know what people carry. We, we do don't know what know. they've been through. But the assumption should be everybody's carrying something and been through something. It's exactly. That's just an assumption, right? And, not, yes. Life could be really life and at the moment. And some people say it out loud and some people carry it silently. Right. They do. And I'm not judging you, I, you know, or anybody, anybody else who, who doesn't want to share. Because there are some people who overshare. It's like, I really don't want to know that your daddy walked around his dog drawers at night. I don't want to know that. Okay. I, that's right. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you were caring for your husband. I was caring for my mom. We were still working. We were still right. doing, we were still expected to show up. Right. And we put, we put on the cloak. Right. 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 We did some superhuman stuff. And um, the reality is we weren't the only ones doing it. But not the only ones doing it. Mm-mm. And we and, ain't going to be the last. And the other part of that is that we may not have done, done it so well because it's hard. Mm-hmm. And we have to tell the truth about that too. Yeah. Um, but some people don't want to share. Sometimes we have to leave them alone. Yeah. And that we, I hate to give up on somebody. But I, I don't believe that I give up on people permanently. I I just kind of believe that you, um, you, you today you may have, have been um, uh, a little upset because of something that happened in your life and you didn't want to share anything. You want to say anything. I noticed that there's something wrong, but I'm going to leave you alone. Or you say to me, you know, I don't feel like talking about that now. I'm going to respect that and move on. So we have to be honest with with each other, I think. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I just keep repeating this honesty. No, this. I mean, I, I love that because often we make issues about other people in our universe. And there is always room for us to improve the relationship we have with ourselves and mm-hmm. with other women, um, particularly Black women. How we show up for each other, how we back each other's plays, how we say, you may not want to talk right now, but I'm still standing with you. Right. Right. I don't need you to talk to see that that you need support, and I and I'm gonna stand. And I'm gonna hold you until you ready. Right. right? Mm-hmm. Whatever that looks like, a daily email, whatever it looks like. And you know, I would say that we're in a place where we collectively need to think differently about how we're showing up for ourselves and each other. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Um, because they, it is, um, it's tough, and in. In philanthropy, it's tough. And then um, we have the added pressures of of people who, if we're talking together, we're planning something, a revolution maybe. 
You know what I'm saying? We there's just all kind of stuff that that goes on in those, as I call them, the hallowed halls of philanthropy. Um, but we have to rise above that for the okay. sake of ourselves, because it's it's just not you or I that need it. We all need it for the sake of ourselves, for the sake of our our um, individuality, for the sake of our collective uh, lives. We need to be um, in community with one another. And that doesn't mean being with somebody every day. But what it does mean is standing in the breach. What it does mean is say is saying, I support you and I fear you. That's all I, I you know, all I need to say right now. It, 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 it does mean that. And those love- some words open up doors that may be closed initially. Thank you for listening to this episode of Centering Conversations, an exclusive brought to you by Conversations with Shonda. This conversation series is powered by Voice Vision Value, Black women leading in philanthropy. We again invite you to like, listen, and rate Conversations with Shonda. This keeps us moving forward and lets us know you appreciate and want to continue to hear more episodes. Thank you for listening. And again, this is Shonda Smith-Baker, from Conversations with Shonda.